I was a special art student in high school and I went to Cornell to study painting and sculpture. My first client was with Andy Warhol. I used to come to New York a lot, visit the artist studios. Roy Lichtenstein, I mean, Clay Zoldenberg, Frank Stella, everyone. I saw what the pop artists were doing. They pushed painting so far, I felt I'm never going to be able to jump again 20 years ahead. And if you remember architecture in 1970, it was pretty much the low point of the 20th century. It came easily to me, and self-interest made me decide to go into architecture. It, it came easy, and I thought, I've got a better chance of doing something really gorgeous in architecture than pushing the fine arts scene 20 years ahead. So that's how I kind of went into that. The factory was done, the walls were done, where you just put spackle on top of the nails. And I never forget, everybody uh, had said, oh, that's so creative, that's so Warholian. You know, sort of every other artist was busy painting their walls pure white, and Andy left them sheetrock with just the spackle on the nails. And he said, oh, it's so typical of Warholian to be so original. And I said, well, no, that decision came after I showed him the estimate to paint the walls white. <laughs> and he was like, why don't you just leave them the way they are? They look good to me. <laughs> so it was, I mean, it, was, it was funny, and he was very close to his dimes. The factory was just the entire world came through the doors of the factory, and that's where I met the Agnelli family, who I eventually worked for quite early in my profession. That's when I met Pierre Berger and Yves Saint Laurent at the factory, and um, who were my also early patrons, and that's where I met the Rothschilds. At a certain point, Andy lived at um, 89th Street and Lexington Avenue with his mom. And his mom got ill and passed away, and he, it was very sad for him. So he purchased what, in my opinion, was an extremely upscale and beautiful Georgian townhouse on East 66th Street. Andy loved the idea of restoring the townhouse. Most of the bathrooms were original, meaning from about 1911, 1912. He loved the idea of, of restoring it to old New York, and he filled the townhouse with incredibly beautiful early American antiques, something that I had never expected to see. I had been with him when he was buying many Art Deco masterpieces by Dunant, by Ruhlman, he was a big collector. Um, but I didn't know that he loved, loved, loved early American furniture. And I learned a lot of that from him. And the house was very, very beautiful, very masculine, and not what anybody expected. <laughs> I've always intermingled completely contemporary art with antiques and what I consider, I call it pure architecture, something pure in a style. I don't like conglomerations, I loathe the term eclectic, I don't care for eclectic to me just means you don't know what you're doing. I say to the kids who work for me, you, you're, you're not doing a successful job if you do a job that could have been done 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And if you look at your work and say, okay, that whole bloody house could have been done 10 years ago, sorry, it's gorgeous, then you failed. You must have a reason to have done what you are doing now very important to me, I think. In other words, you don't push design. I love tons of natural light. Um, I'm as green as they get. I, mean, <laughs> I really do believe in not wasting the planet's resources, um, which is very important to me. But it's important to me that, as an architect, you make everybody's life better. I, I like a very simple ease of uh, circulation, and I believe that people's time should not be wasted. So I like to present merchandise very quickly, very upfront, very directly. We had focus groups. I never forget a, a woman <laughs> saying, I said, well, what do you really want when you stand to buy a handbag? Should I want to stand at a counter and see the whole selection, please? I don't want to go to like four different walls. It, I, I have very little time with somebody who had two small kids, and I understood that that um, even in this world of luxury where you're buying handbags perhaps for several thousand euros, that woman 
also values her time very highly. I'm a little old school because I, first of all, I learned to draft by hand with pencil and then with ink, something called a rapidograph. The, the kids who work for me now don't even know what a rapidograph is, but there was great satisfaction because you had 11 different points on the rapidograph of making lines thinner or thicker. And there was a great artistry in doing your drawings. Now the computers in the 1990s have enabled architects to do visual imaging that never existed before. And it's the explosion of architecture. I mean, it came about with Frank Gehry's um, Bilbao Museum. And good for him, because he brought to everybody's attention the fact that buildings are now being created that could never have been created before. Well, I started doing residential projects because that's the work that came my way. And I started doing commercial projects with the advent of Barney's. And there's a funny story when Mr. Fred Presman called me up and said, we're looking for a designer for Barney's. Um, they used a fellow named Gordon Chadwick before for 20 years, who was a chap I knew, a very good architect. He was elderly and he had died around 85 years old. And I, and I, <laughs> this is a famous story, I said, Mr. Presman, there's no point in my wasting your time. I've never done any shops, you know. At the moment on my own, all I've done is private residential work. But of course, he read Women's Wear Daily. He knew that the private residential work was Yves Saint Laurent, Andy Warhol, and the Agnelli. So he was like, he was very, I mean, he was significantly older than me, and he said, listen, Sonny, all I'm looking for is talent. I know everything there is about making a store work. You, you know? so, so I said, oh, okay, well then I'll come over. And I showed him the portfolio, and we talked and met several times with Fred and his wife, Phyllis. And my entire retail career began with a chocolate counter for Lilac chocolates that was five feet long. He said, can you add a chocolate counter to Barney's? And I was like, I guess. This is like a little small, but I guess. But he was clever because he wanted to see would I integrate it, would I add a new style, would I... And I made a five-foot chocolate counter. It was my first retail experience. And from there, we renovated the entire men's store, then we added the women's store in the late 80s, as he wanted his eldest son, Gene, brought into the business. And that was a revelation for me, because they took me to Europe and all the shows, and met many, many, many designers. And they go, well, oh, how, how did you meet Giorgio Armani? He's so private. And I said, I had to present to him the Armani boutique for Barney's. I had to meet him. He was impressed with me, and that's how I got his house to do. I said, it was very interesting. I had to meet Carla Fendi. How, how, how are you doing all the Fendi stores? I met Carl Fendi. He said, nobody gets to me, <laughs> but Barney's would send you, and they needed a sign-off for their boutiques. So I'm, uh, that's how I met Calvin Klein, and I did his stores. That's how I met Donna Karen. It's pretty simple, the story of my going there. It's all through Barney's. It's difficult sometimes, because the major difference between commercial and residential, of course, is time and budget. When you take these commercial projects, the rents are so astronomical, at least in my mind, that the companies are paying, the bar is raised so high that even one month can sometimes cost millions of dollars. It's, it's quite extraordinary. So there's, there's enormous pressure on a commercial project. Now, wealthy people put a lot of pressure on you to finish their homes too, but it's not quite the same. They're not losing maybe two million a month by not having their house done. So there's slightly less pressure, and I'm at this point in my career where I don't um, take residential projects where the pressure would be too extreme. Well, I call myself an interior architect, but for me it's all the same. Interior architecture, exterior architecture, landscape architecture, it's all the same. I mean, I'm landscaping my own gardens in, in the east end of Long Island. I've been doing it for 10 years and I find it remarkably the same as, as interior design. I mean, I stand there and I have to move all the plants around constantly. It's an art that you cannot do on paper. And I always love the story of Russell Page when Mrs. Agnelli told me, because she did those beautiful gardens for her in Turin, he said, you know, he at a certain point said, I'm not even gonna bother. I mean, he would sketch out the basic thing but the rest of it, he would stand there while it was being planted because it's all, there are so many thousands of 
visual angles, you can't put it together on paper and it doesn't make any sense. I, I've said several times that the most difficult design challenge is to do a chair. And I'll tell you why, if you do a commode, nobody has to sit on it and be comfortable. Um, if you do a building, there's always parts that work, maybe other parts that don't. But a chair has to be totally functional and work, it has to be totally beautiful, it has to be totally strong. And it involves so many hands, the, the, the fellow who's, who's making the wood frame, the fellow who's upholstering it, the, the fabric, it's very, very complex and it's a challenge to do one. I'm very proud of the chairs I made for Poltrona Frau, I think they're a classic, they've been selling for years, but it's, it, it's, it's a very big challenge for an architect to do. So we, do, we do a lot of furniture design, both for private residential commissions. We'll design something like a uh, custom dining table. We'll make custom dining chairs. And we design all the furniture to express the brand values of my brands. For instance, everything in a Chanel, from the coffee tables to the chairs and sofas and curtains is designed by me. And the, the amount of sampling and mock-ups, I sometimes wonder if the public understands how many thousands of hours go, goes into making a new facade or a new type of glass. So I feel that my style is something that actually defines the time in which we live, which means it combines many things. It'll combine the art in which we live, some of the tastes that people have in furniture and textiles in which we live, and a very definite modernity in the architecture. Before we take a client, I always inspect all of the product that the company is making. I, I, it's, it, it's kind of funny, we get calls all the time and going, oh, you know, we'd really like you to do a store, offices, or a showroom for something. I say, who are you, what do you make, what do you do, or something like that. And if, I, and if I feel the product is not of a high enough caliber, I'm not really interested, because it says something to me that they're not going to be so interested in really good architecture either. I have a training to actually say what I think. I think it, it's better to just be direct. I don't really have time in my life to be as polished as uh, I find some people. So I'm pretty fucking blunt. <laughs> Very often I combine or actually I compare myself to, to a chef because the, the ingredients are there but you always put something new and you tweak it and somehow it tastes differently. When I know that a lot of people would begin with what do I want the shape, what do I want the form, I always think that comes later. Many designers begin with that and then four months later go, I don't know what color it should be and so the architects make everything white or beige because they're really not thinking like that, they're wildly thinking about the shape. So it's a bit of a different approach. A store presents a designer's idea. We have this wall you'll see for the new women's concept for Louis Vuitton where Mark's entire concept of how he saw the dresses accessorized, everything together is presented. So you see the designer's vision. You can't really get that on, on a computer. You don't understand it. And in a store we can. And to see and to smell and to touch, and by the way, to try clothes on, um, my joke is e-commerce is for seriously overweight people. They are shocked that Chanel doesn't look at all like Dior, it doesn't look at all like Vuitton. And I go, why are you shocked? No two of my homes look the same either. They're different clients. They have completely different requirements. And the brands have different values. One could be more sporty, one could be more formal, uh, one could be more glamorous. Just like people, they, they have their own personalities and I work with that. And I never forgot when we were called by the director of the Dresden State Museum and said, um, like, I've got a real challenge for you because uh, we want a very large porcelain museum design and we want people to go and we can't, in surveys, even get five people out of a hundred who said they would go and look at a porcelain show. He said, not only do I want to engage you in order that you get people to go, but I want them to desire the porcelain to understand its desirability. So he went with me through some of the shops and he talked to some of the women and he 
um, started laughing. He said, they're crazy about the story. They're cra he said, it's just a black handbag. I don't get it. This was a gentleman, a very, a very brilliant curator of Paulson. He said, I don't get it. How do you make them go crazy for that? So he said, you're definitely hired. If you can do that for a black leather handbag, you can do the porcelain of Augustus the Strong. I believe in taking icons of a brand that help reinforce the brand's personality. I uh, like to give as an, as an example all the religious painters during the Renaissance, and I always go, uh, the biggest piece of propaganda I've ever saw was Michelangelo Sistine Chapel. Um, it's great, it makes you believe in God. He did his job. I mean, he was selling God, that's what he was selling. You know, I've got to sell handbags, I've got, <laughs> I've got to get you to believe in it, how do I do it? Well, you'd take Chanel's icons, her rolls of pearls, you'd take her Familiars. Everybody's got in their personalities thing that they love. And I use the brand um, identities to help clarify the different uh, brands. And it's very good. We commission artists, and part of what would make a Peter Marino space unique is the commissioning of art for residences, stores, hotels, health spas. And when I say commissioning, it's not I find too much in my profession people go again after the space is designed and they go, let's go pick out a piece of art for that wall, which I think is a bit missing an opportunity. It's more fun to bring artists in very early in the project and say, what would you do? Where would you like to work? What do you want to do? And they help create spaces. They help create textures. And uh, the commissions I've done, I'm very proud of all the artists we've worked with, from Jim Terrell at at Vuitton, to Jean-Michel Autourniel, at Chanel, and, and uh, it's great. I seriously collect things in over 10 fields. I love rare 18th century books. Uh, I love antique American silver. I collect porcelain. I collect modern paintings. I collect photography. Um, and uh, I have a serious collection of Renaissance bronzes that were shown at the Wallace Collection and the Huntington. And this not my goal to die with ten dollars in the bank. It's my goal to die <laughs> surrounded by all the beautiful things I collect. Art re releases endorphins. It's kind of like sex. You know, if you see something beautiful through your eyes, you just feel a lot better for a long time. Architecture is the three-dimensional um, rationalization of uh, your physical surroundings. That's what it is. It's, it's, a, it's the materialistic walls that shape your life, shape the environment in which you work. It's something like music. It can be inspirational. It can be a real downer. It can be too loud. So I think before Barney's, I sincerely believe that no one took the fashion industry serious for architecture. There were commercial firms who did dress shops. That, Serious architects um, at the beginning, even <laughs> I won't name any names, but who said, I remember when I first did when Al Peter Marino, he does dress shops. You know, Ten years later, Herzog and Zemmerong and Rem Koolhaas were dying to get Prada commissions. But it wasn't always the case until I, I like to feel that at least as a serious architect, I said, hey guys, you know, dress shops, luxury brands are the, are the proper respectful venue for good architecture and I like to feel that I raised the bar worldwide for that. If I hadn't become an architect I um, probably would what I would like to have done is to be a gardener. Uh, gardens make me crazy and um, I understand the whole myth of the Garden of Eden how it could have began because gardens are the best place to spend your life <laughs> if you had a choice. <laughs>